Good afternoon, friends. Uh, on behalf of uh, Center for Urban Science and Engineering, as well as uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, I have immense pleasure in uh, welcoming uh, Professor Eric Isaac. Uh, as uh, circulated in the uh, email, Professor Isaac is uh, currently the provost of the University of Chicago. Uh, is basically a professor of physics and formerly director of the Agron National Laboratory uh, in uh, the US. Now, uh, he will today uh, talk to us on uh, solving the grand challenges of the world's uh, cities, uh, urban science and energy and specifically he will focus on uh, the how urban challenges such as pollution and traffic can be addressed in partnership between uh, data scientists and policy makers. We have some data scientists here and some of us are in the policy making. So, it is going to be a good learning experience for us. So, basically using the research done at the Energy Policy Institute at the University of Chicago. Uh, so, on behalf of the institute we welcome you and uh, so glad to have you here. Thank you. So, Thank you uh, and I really appreciate you hosting me Professor Narayan. Uh, so, I am Eric Isaacs. His just heard. And my title is, I took out the word grand. It's, um, it's, a, it's a grand title basically trying to solve this urban challenge. Um, and so what I think I'd like to do is actually ask a somewhat different question is what, what can we in universities do about these urban, these grand urban challenges. And um, so let me start first by, by just explaining a bit about the University of Chicago. Some of you may know us. This is a, a picture of us this is downtown Chicago, so we're just south of the city. Some of you may have visited us in one time or another. And, and the reason I think universities are really well, uh, well tooled to do these kinds of major challenges is because the urban challenge, of course, as we've already heard, is not just data scientists or just a bunch of uh, physicists like myself, a bunch of geeks sitting in a room. It really is uh, a, a, a true collaboration. It's, it's scientists, it's politicians, it's it's, uh, it's people in non-governmental organizations all working in some, in some partnership uh, because even as, as academics as we are, you have an answer. It does nothing to blow, you know, just to holler into the wind. You really need to think big. So a university like, like IIT Mum, uh, Mumbai has, hmm, let's see if I can get this to work. There we go. Ha has a lot, of, uh, a lot of different types of, of, of disciplines. And so at the University of Chicago, just by way of talking about urban, uh, we have uh, five divisions. We're broken into five divisions, physical sciences, humanities, social sciences, a college, which is really where we teach our undergraduates, and a biological sciences. So if you think about urban challenges, you've got the technological challenges. You've got, so you need physical sciences. You've got certainly health issues. So our biological sciences has a hospital, but we also have biologists think about biology, thinking about disease. Uh, you've got real big social issues, and so in fact, Social sciences, uh, we visited yesterday with the Tata Institute of Social Science, which was originate, the original director of that was a University of Chicago uh, faculty member who came from what we call social services administration, part of social sciences, which is all about social welfare. When you think about big urban cities, of course, social issues are, are tantamount. You can't just establish, collect data, say, well, we're going to do this and this and this. You really have to understand people and understand how people behave. And last but not least, humanities. You really have to understand more than, than just the science. You have to understand the humanistic aspects to it. So a university really is well suited to, to think about these problems. Um, in addition, at the University of Chicago, we have, if I can get this to work, I may just do it by hand. We have six professional schools. So we have the Booth School of Business, also thinking about urban problems. Even if you had a solution, you've got to scale it. You've got to think about how to make it something which is business worthy. Uh, we have Harris School of Public Policy. Uh, it, policy is very, how do you write good policy that actually can be followed? And some of the things I'll talk about are data-driven policy decisions. The Harris School is a critical part of that. SSA, I mentioned social services. These are actual social workers. They do interventions in families to think about the social issues. We have a law school thinking about writing laws. So when you think about the urban challenge, all of these will play a role, and a medical school, of course, health. And, and above all of it, the University of Chicago, uh, like IIT Mumbai is embedded in a major city, a really important city in the U.S. Mumbai is, one could argue, the city in India. <laughs> Maybe if you're in Delhi, you may not agree. Uh, but, you know, we are actually located on the south side of Chicago, which is where a lot of poverty exists. So when you think about affecting society, you think about, you know, we, we live it every day in a sense. Our medical center takes 40% uh, of, our, of our admits are from the south side, lower income, 
uh, poor people who, who, so thinking about the problem holistically is extremely important. And um, one of the things that characterizes the University of Chicago is the fact that we have many institutes that are designed to draw together uh, the different components of these divisions. And the one you'll hear me talk about in the next half hour, 45 minutes, is the Energy Policy, the energy, uh, the energy policy Institute at Chicago, which thinks about an economist's point of view, Michael Greenstone, we just hired from MIT, thinks about the problem of urban environments, thinks about the problem of energy and sustainability and pollution in the context of, of an economist in, in terms of not just policy but also incentives and, and et cetera. So I thought I would just give a little background. Probably most of you know this, uh, so a lot of this stuff, but this is, you know, this is the uh, per capita energy use. So just talk about energy and I'm going to talk about pollution or talk about uh, carbon. Energy use per capita versus GDP, gross domestic product per capita. Uh, and, um, and this is a chart that was made uh, by actually from the International Energy Agency's data by someone at UC Berkeley. And, uh, you know, do it by hand. Uh, so, of course, the USA, uh, other OECD, but the ones I want to highlight, of course, are, are India and China, which are uh, poised to to explode, uh, already in a position where things are just changing extremely rapidly. And the question really here is uh, what? This is just a, if you will, a one of the data, which maybe some of you have even seen, which came from the World Bank, which just is a, if you will, it's a spectator or it's a indicator of the kind of growth you're seeing here in India. This is just number of air conditioning units. It's not necessarily the only thing which talks about energy use, but if you think about uh, electricity, it's basically the use of electricity is just essentially linear with air conditioner use. And this is a good thing, the fact that the, it's a healthy thing, it's a, it's a positive thing, but this kind of growth, which is 14% annually, and I think it's actually even accelerating in the last year or two, this data is already th about three years old, uh, is remarkable. And it, it's, ask, it's begging the question, you know, how are we going to handle the kind of growth here? And I'll get to Urban in a minute. Um, this is also another chart from the, uh, uh, the, uh, the um, International Energy Agency. It's their outlook, 2011, but it hasn't changed. I apologize that I could have gotten 2014. But what you see here is that, uh, that if you look at the, the OECD countries, these are the, ec the economically developed countries, uh, US uh, and Europe, et cetera, uh, and you look at the blue and energy consumption, in the next 10 or 20 years, it goes up a bit, but it's not skyrocketing. The biggest growth by far in energy consumption will be basically India and China. There's no surprise here, right? Uh, and, and, and you can just, it's very easy to see that. So, so that's, that's, uh, uh, that's other, that's just pulling out Asia. Uh, this is with the increase in energy use, of course, if, with some models, with the increase in energy use comes an increase in carbon. So what you're seeing also is that this, these bright green, this is again, uh, China and India, a dramatic increase in carbon. If we essentially do business as usual, that means that, you know, growth is in China. It's essentially a, a coal plant being built uh, several coal plants being built per week in China, uh, similar growth here in India. So if, if you think about that energy growth, you're also driving a large amount of carbon and other types of pollutants. And so this is the issue that we're facing. And so the question comes back to uh, this one, which is cities. Um, are they the problem or the solution? So cities are really amazing places. The tremendous amount of, of population density, of course, drives not just negative things, but positive things. It drives innovation, drives creativity. Uh, it, it drives an energy level, which actually produces economic growth. It does many things. Um, but of course, cities can also lead to, uh, uh, by the way, this is a, a picture of Bangalore. Um, if those, I don't know if any of you recognize the city, but sorry? Chinatown in Bangalore? <laughs> But it is Bangalore. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and here, here's the data, right? So this is, um, this is actually United Nations data, uh, which, is, uh, which is to say, if we're actually, we've actually crossed in the last five or 10 years, we crossed a really critical point where historically the growth, there was a larger number of people living in, in urban settings, uh, in, sorry, in, in rural settings than urban settings. So what happened in around 2010 was there was this crossover to we actually now have more people living in cities than living in urban. So that means that more than 50% of the world now lives in urban centers. And you can see the projections are just going to continue to grow. China's driving this intentionally as an economic driver. It's happening here in India, partially intentionally, partially just because that's where the jobs are. 
Um, so I just put some get together some, some data on the challenge here in India, and I'll come back to some of these. Um, uh, if you just look at, at India, I'll come back to some of these numbers as I said, but if you just look at India, it's about, it's about 250 to 300 million by, by 2025. The, the growth in cities will be 250 to 300 million, something like that. In China, the number's more like 400 million. So the growth in cities is just remarkable. And of course, the question you have to ask is, can we do this in a way which not only supports that growth, but is sustainable? Is sustainable from an energy growth point of view? And then, of course, when you grow energy, are you also doing it in a way which is sane, which is a minimal carbon or at least some carbon? You and here's some numbers. So, so right now, of course, these are numbers you guys know. I just thought I'd put them up here. 300 million people in this country lack electricity, period. So they're off the grid. Um, and this number I'll come back to, too. 3.2 years increase in average life expectancy for 660 million. This is a challenge. Uh, it turns out you can do numbers, uh, and I'll show you numbers from China. You can actually connect the amount of carbon in the air to lifespan. And if you start connecting those two, I at least you know, the, you know the information and whether that's an incentive for us to think about reducing carbon is a good question. And the other thing, which is, which is not a happy uh, statement, which is that 13 of the world's top 20 most air polluted cities are here in India. And, and I believe Delhi is right now uh, the worst. It's actually gotten worse than, than Beijing simply because of growth and, and consumption. It's continuing to increase. So these are really big challenges, and the question or the vision might be to say, cities, can they be made livable through some kind of evidence-based policy, uh, intelligent, energy-efficient, renewable technology, some combination of policy, technology, et cetera. So I'm not gonna stand up here and say I have an answer for that, but I will show you some of the things that, at least at Chicago, we're starting to do to think about some of these, uh, some of these big challenges. I've already said this. I mean, this is a, a, an interesting, just for visual, if you need a visual to really believe this growth. This is the um, Pearl River Delta um, in, uh, in, Guang, in Guangdong province uh, in, uh, in China uh, from 1980 to 2005. And it's just, and that's 25 years for that kind of development is, is shockingly fast. And you can just see visually what's going on here. Uh, and, and these are the numbers. 70% uh, of, of Chinese people live in cities with one million or more people by 2025. 10 years. Uh, by 2030, uh, 221 cities will have over one million people. And this, I probably should have put in a major building here in Mumbai. This is the Empire State Building in New York City. I'm from New York, so this was. But if you think about it, w w what China has to do is construct one New York City every year for several decades. They also have to produce one coal plant a day. And we can, we can argue about uh, you know, throwing in nuclear and, and a bigger nuclear power plant. And it's, it's even more atrocious because you can't build nuclear power plants that fast. So, so these kinds of numbers are staggering. <coughs> staggering. And you know, for India, um, you can argue they're similar. I really apologize about this, uh, this, but as I said, probably a lot of you know some of the numbers. I've already mentioned that, that 300 million people are without electricity. We'd like to turn them on to electricity, both from an educational point of view, uh, a pure quality of life point of view, water, huge problem, I'm, and on and on and on. This is actually a chart that was prepared by IBM, who's thinking carefully about smart cities, about the changes, and how to think about starting to manage these flows of, of people into, into major cities. So the basic theme of this talk is what can cities do, and what can they do with real, real information? And one of the things we always pay attention to it. University of Chicago, I'm sure you do here at, at IIT, is, is the data and understanding first and foremost what the data is telling us. We can predict into the future all we want, but unless we understand the data today, uh, we don't have anything. So what kinds of things might you think about using data for? Um, and and I'll, I'll give you examples. I'll, I'll highlight some of these as we go through the talk. Uh, but if you think about you know, data, what can you do with data? Uh, think about policies and infrastructure investment. If you had good data, for example, on health, crime, I'll show you some examples in crime where we're having good data on, on different types of policies or experiments in, uh, in education actually Im impact the level of crime and recidivism in the city of Chicago. Um, energy, of course, and, uh, and low income energy, cheap energy. Uh, road pricing, uh, one of the things a lot of cities and maybe Mumbai will consider it one day is, is how we think about do we want to you know, London does this now, there's a premium for driving your car into the city uh, based on what data? And the question is, even if you start charging, how does that, how effective is that? And so asking questions like that, understanding what data to collect, and then uh, congestion charging. Uh, other things you can think about doing is operations. And some people here are operations specialists. 
uh, thinking about uh, traffic flow. I'll show you an example of an experiment we haven't tried yet. We're about to try in Chicago to study uh, all kinds of traffic, human and, and automobile traffic in the city to understand flow and, and questions, can you do anything about it? I'll also show you a cool experiment done by Berkeley and, and MIT in the Berkeley area, in the Stanford area, which shows how, how more managed rush hour traffic can make a big difference in commute times, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. So I won't go through all these. Uh, infrastructure planning, uh, increased regulatory compliance, and this I will give examples of, that even if you have regulation, for example, on factories, is it being enforced? And is it being incentivized in the right way? And I'll come back and talk about that in some experiments. Uh, and, then, and then the connection between, uh, for example, environment and the impact of environment uh, on things like asthma, on health. And c if you can monitor things like carbon dioxide or ozone, can you then make connections to occurrences or, or, or outbreaks of things like asthma or other diseases? Of course, the answer to all these must be yes. But the question is how to, how to do all these things and think about it. And, and I, won't, I won't finish all these, okay. So the real, the real big vision in all this, um, and this is where you know, us uh, scientists, engineers, and even social scientists believe in data, maybe sometimes too much, is in principle, if you really do the right things, you make some really good models, you could move from what we do now, which is very heuristic, it's very random and, and arbitrary, which we were just talking about. Cities have grown the way they are in a very ad hoc, I don't think there's many cities that are planned, um, and could you actually go from that into a, in something which is really based on, on, clear, on clear information and data? And I, I don't know the answer to that. And in fact, maybe none of us would want to live in a city that's overplanned. But considering the number of cities that are being built here in, in India and the number in China, it's a good opportunity to ask the question, can we do something? Uh, so we want to go from a reactive to proactive. And one thing I want to highlight, which I've already said, is one of the keys, I think, to success in anything that you want to do in the urban space is is you know, we academics tend to have great ideas and publish and then say, uh, I have an idea and throw it over the fence. You guys figure it out. It just doesn't work because most of the things that we think will work, we may have the right answer, but government will never succumb to our ideas. Really, you need to ver right at the beginning have, have clear relationships with government, non-government organizations, uh, and, and universities. So I think this is a huge opportunity for all of us. So, so what I'd like to do uh, in the next few minutes is just give some examples of the kinds of things uh, we're working on in at the University of Chicago, some of them in the city of Chicago, some of them more, more global. Um, but also, uh, I'll throw in some examples that I just like that have been done elsewhere that I think are fantastic. So the first one really connects, um, it's hard to find data where, which is so clear on things like pollution. You can measure pollution, you can measure changes in pollution. But this is, this is a very interesting story that was done by um, Michael Greenstone, uh, who runs this Energy Policy Institute at Chicago, looking at, uh, looking at the effect of life expectancy, uh, the effect of pollution on life expectancy. So it, it's rare you get such a clean experiment. In China, they had a policy uh, called the, the Huai River Policy. And that policy, um, it, it, in a way, it was a, a terrible policy, maybe, but it, it was great because it was a great scientific experiment. Um, and, and so what they did here, this is the Y River, this brown, this brown line running right down the middle of China. And the policy simply stated was that um, in the winter, or, or any time of the year, you know, cold times of the month, not any time, uh, the policy was that any, any residents north of the Y River would get major subsidies for coal. And most of the residents burn some form of coal to heat their homes. And anywhere south of the Y River, there were no subsidies. So you, you could pay for it, but what it meant is that literally you'd cross a bridge and you'd go from a, a house that was nice and toasty warm to a house that was actually cold because, of course, the river being, I don't know, 100 meters across, the temperature is pretty much the same on both sides. So, so they set this policy, which is an interesting way to think. So, so what, what Michael Greenstone and his colleagues were able to do, this is he did this back when he was at MIT, was effectively measure, the first thing they did is they measured the particulate content in the atmosphere, both south and north of the Y River, uh, as a result of a consequence of this policy. And so this is degrees north of the Y River. This is the zero is the Y River. 10 degrees north, so this is south, this is north. <coughs> and basically measured the amount of total suspended particulate in, in just milligrams per cubic meter. It's just a simple measurement, really. It's done pretty easily. Uh, and what you can see is a very clear, uh, very clear statistically significant jump 
literally at the Wye River. I mean, you could say it should spread a little bit, but this is during active season, and over time it does. But you can actually see the fact that there's a substantial 30-40% uh, jump, statistically uh, real jump in uh, it's, it's 200, about 250 microgram uh, cub uh, micro per cu cubic micro or milligrams per, per meters cubed uh, jump as you cross the river. And so then the question becomes, um, what's the impact on life expectancy? So they did a longitudinal study. Uh, the, the policy, I think, was implemented in 19, uh, I think it was in 1980, if I remember correctly. Um, and so he was able to cover a, a fairly long period of time and then looked at life expectancy. And this is just age, uh, age of individuals. And this is the same uh, horizontal axis. And what you can see is also statistically significant. Obviously, the size of these circles has to do with the, uh, the uncertainty in the, in the, in the measurement. Uh, you can see as you move away uh, in, in degrees north or south, uh, the, there's a jump right there. And you can actually integrate under these curves and estimate the total impact on, on life expectancy. But basically, at the border, there is a, a five-year, almost a five-year jump. So this was real statistical evidence that something was going on. And um, so the thing in China was that he published this data, and China hasn't done anything about it. Uh, the, the policy kind of came to an end. But it was very interesting because it just showed what the impact of, of coal, burning coal was. So. Um, what, what the estimate is, of course, is if you think, if you just do all the numbers, right, and, and you do this, it's a bit of a PR stunt at some level. On the other hand, if you just say that, uh, th and you integrate those numbers, it's, it's about 500 million people in northern chi China are losing more than two and a half billion years, meaning about five years of their life due to the pollution. So it's a rough estimate, but it gives you a sense that the kind of pollution you're seeing actually does have an impact on life expectancy. Now, in the case of China, so it was real good data. Um, and, it, and it showed something. In the case of China, it didn't inform any policy, not yet. So maybe it will inform policy. But in the case of China, it basically didn't. Um, so Michael Greenstone has just recently started to work in, in India in the last five years and have done, has done similar estimates here in India just by looking at the, the impact of the China experiment, which basically measured the particulate matter. And if you measure particulate matter and, and do a rough, almost a back of the envelope calculation, we're talking about about three years loss in average life expectancy in India. Uh, this, of course, isn't, you know, this is a statistically significant number, uh, one that has to be, you know, looked at and, and appreciated for what it is. But, uh, you know, if you just take 3.2 years out of, out of the life of Indian society, it's a big number. And so it's not so different from, from China. And <clears throat> the question is, does this suggest some kind of policy change? So it's data. Here it is. This, this is um, an average over India in terms of particulate amounts. So this isn't published yet, though. Oh, yeah. Th yeah, OK. And to, what were the numbers there? Three, three or four years, yeah. So this is a remarkable. You know, it's, it's something, when, when you quantify it this way, you know, I guess this is, the, for scientists, you say, well, that's just multiplying the number of people times life expectancy. But if you talk to a politician about that kind of number, it makes a big difference. If you can say you can shave, you know, even if you can, if you can do an, a shave a year or give someone a year more of life, it's a big deal. So that's, that's, this is a story about pollution associated with, with energy and the use of energy. Uh, I'm going to change my gears a little bit here and talk a little bit about infrastructure. Um, this is one of my favorite bridges. Uh, it, it's a beautiful bridge. Um, uh, and I guess you can say it's helped alleviate traffic in Mumbai, but it also hasn't solved the problem. Uh, but it is, it really is thought of as a, a way to alleviate traffic. So, and I'm just using this as, a, as emblematic uh, of what I want to talk about. But <clears throat> one of the things in thinking about, uh, about this is the bond, those of you, I mean, everyone here is probably driven on the Bondra Worley Sea Link. Um, the, um, it, the thing about this, the only thing I'd say about Bondra Worley is it does, uh, it does kind of drive you to think about automobiles and not other solutions. Uh, and so the question is, is this the right, the right approach to alleviating traffic. And, and that's just a question I'll leave hanging in the air. But it's, it's a fantastic bridge. As I understand it, actually, it was supposed to extend all the way down the coast. Is that right? It was supposed to It would have been much better. It would have taken a lot less time to get down to the, anyway. <clears throat> so I wanted to show you one experiment, which I also thought was very interesting, which, um, which was done by, um, which, which is related to traffic and infrastructure. Uh, just to give you a sense of how data can tell you a lot of stuff about 
what could be simple policy decisions. And I, I'll explain to you what a policy might be. There's no policy yet implemented from this data. What a policy might be, um, and this study was done by UC Berkeley MIT team um, a, a, a couple years back. And this is, um, this is the Silicon Valley area, Palo Alto around Stanford and Silicon Valley. I don't know how many of you have driven on 101. You know what it's like? <laughs> yeah. So, so you think twice about going out any time other than at the extreme time. Uh, extreme. So they said, well, uh, they were able to make a deal with a, a, the with a phone company uh, to essentially uh, be able to get um, um, decoded uh, data. So in other words, just using GPS data, not knowing who, you know, privacy issues, so they didn't know who it was. And they, <clears throat> and they did some calculations based on, on the GPS data uh, from cell phones uh, to think about how they might use that data to reduce congestion. And uh, I won't go through the, the, the formula on this, but what they found was they, they, did, some, they did some modeling, right? Um, delta T, so if you think about, th this is a big number here. This is, um, relates to the, uh, the, total, uh, the total commute time, okay? So what they did was, first of all, this is just a distribution of uh, probability distribution of commute times, TC, in minutes. And you can see actually uh, extends way out uh, to many, many minutes. This is you know, five hour commute times uh, or more. But uh, f this, this is not, by the way, single cars. This is, this is total commute time. It turns out that actually the numbers are really impressive because I gotta remember what they are. But um, the, the total commute time in, uh, I can't find it, but the total commute time, if you integrate overall, okay, so, so if, you look at, if you look at this chart, the total commute time is something like, um, um, it's many billions of hours for, for San Franciscoites. It turns out that the, if you use the GPS data, you can actually reduce about four billion hours from total travel time. And the reason you can do that is because, I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. Um, if you do that, of course, you make people a lot less stressed. But more importantly, that's a, a few billion gallons of, of fuel as well. So it's, it's a very important connection. So what they did is they said, well, what, they did a Gedanken experiment, basically. They said, if we could, um, if these are curves. So they did the Bay Area and Boston. Also, have you driven in Boston? Boston is equally frustrating. And I, I, I went to school in Boston. It's horrible. Um, and, and it's like the Bay Area. And what they basically said is, is um, they, they said, OK, if people drive randomly, uh, there's, a, there's a measured result. And th so that's this, this green line here for the Bay Area. And it's, the, uh, it's the, this line here for, for the, um, uh, for the uh, Boston area. And what they said is if we pulled out, they basically said if we pulled out 1% of the drivers. So we were able to determine, we were able to signal people uh, using their phones or what have you, don't come out until such and such a time. Delay by as little as 15 minutes. So meaning they would tell people when they could drive, which is an issue in itself. So it's not a policy that's necessarily implementable. But they claim that if they could select 1% of the drivers, the right drivers, but they could select 1% of the drivers, they could reduce congestion by 20%, which is huge when you're talking about the many billions of hours that are consumed in driving. And this basically chart shows it. And, and there's actually a detailed calculation which goes with this. But the point is that this, this is the 1%. And they could actually do, dr these are dramatic changes in the ability to, uh, to reduce the congestion. So it's just, it was an idea that hasn't yet been used for any policy. But again, it's interesting data that does something. Here's some other interesting uh, data that hasn't been used yet. Um, this was actually also um, MIT. I said I would be using other people's data. Uh, they had something called the Sensible City Lab, and they did this study. This is Rome, and what this is, the red is, the, uh, is essentially the, the cloud of GPS users. So it's the telephones, everyone's telephone. And these yellow uh, dashes are, let's see, it's a movie, so I'll get it to move for you. But it's, um, these yellow um, streaks are buses. So the question, the question they were asking was, um, could they use the GPS data and the bus traffic to do something intelligent about how the buses were being, were being shuttled around the city? And, um, and, and the, the answer, of course, is yes. Uh, the buses here, I mean, they're, they're reasonably located where the, where the people are, but one could do, a in principle, a better job at routing buses if you knew, if you could collect that kind of data. And so this data is always available. There's nothing fancy about this. You have GPSs on the buses. You have GPS on every, every cell phone user. 
Um, as of yet, it's not being used to set policy, but it's interesting data nonetheless. I thought I'd throw this in, sort of the last slide on transportation. Uh, this is, a, some of you may even know about this, this project. This is the BART Rapid Transit uh, a project where it was actually very innovative in some sense. And it, it's, to me, when I first looked at it, someone showed it to me. I said, well, that's obvious and simple. But they actually put in this exceptionally extensive, it's now about 50 kilometers of bus service through the city, which, you know, so instead of encouraging cars, they encouraged a bus service. So it's a real simple solution. Uh, easily accessible, connected up with the train system. I mean, it sounds obvious, but it actually transferred, it, it did shift a lot of traffic, road traffic into buses. So it's just thinking simply is often the answer that you want. Okay, so um, I want to change the subject a little bit because and, and, I've been talking about data, and the question is can this data influence policy? Uh, you know, as a scientist, I think, well, great science. Again, you know, come up with great data, you know, the data that MIT took in Rome, so someone ought to do something about it. And uh, the question is, um, is that science data and technology enough? And the answer, of course, is not. So, so I wanted to show you another experiment which was done here in India uh, by EPIC, by the Energy Policy Institute of Chicago, but really asking the question, if you have good data, how can you affect policy? Can you make a difference in policy? Um, and the answer comes back, the answer is yes, but only if. And that if is if you have all the right relationships in place. So let me show you another, what I think is a really cool uh, project, uh, which, is about, uh, um, which is about pollution in, in, in the state of Gujarat. So, uh, and the title of it is Truth Telling by Third Party Auditors and the Response of Polluting Firms. The basic idea here is that the system, uh, there, there's regulatory, there are rules in Gujarat about, about pollution and there are inspectors. The inspectors, and this is not so uncommon worldwide, but the inspectors were being paid by the companies for which they were reporting on their pollution st statistics. And you can imagine what kind of impact that would have. Um, I don't need to show you this. Everybody here knows where Gujarat is. But, um, but Gujarat, so it's highly industrialized, got a lot of the uh, industrial manufacturing for this country. Um, it, there's extremely high water and air pollution, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, um, and it violates air quality standards. So the problem was that the Gujarat Pollution Control Board, which regulates 20,000 of these, of these industrial plants, was regulating those plants, A, based on, uh, uh, based on inspectors who were paid for by the company, but also there was no, there was no negotiation with the company. If you were above uh, the limits, you c the company would be shut down, and if you were below the limits, you'd continue to operate. So there was no real relationship and there was a bad incentive mechanism, and this is just a picture of some inspectors. I'm sure those are good inspectors. <laughs> so this is a measure. So before EPIC uh, proposed the experiment they wanted to propose, uh, they, this, was the, uh, this was this sort of official uh, measure of, of pollution. Uh, this is a bar graph showing the percentage of plants, percentage of plants out of that 20,000 based on audits uh, that were, and the particulate matter that they were producing the, the reg, uh, Gujarat regulatory li limit is about 150 uh, milligrams per cubic meter. And not surprisingly, every single plant was, every single plant was producing at or below uh, the limit. Uh, and you, know, you could look at that and say, great, Gujarat's uh, in great shape. Uh, but of course, when you look at pictures like, like this, you, know, you, you ask the question, can that really be true? So the proposed experiment was actually, to, this is an economist thinking about policy. So, First of all, there's a question of the data. And second of all, there was a question about incentives for the inspectors. So what the, and, and this involved partnership between the Gujarat Pollution Control Board, GCPB, uh, and the companies. And what, what the proposed uh, solution was had four parts. First of all, uh, um, auditors would not be selected by the companies. They'd be randomly assigned. And a lot of this sounds obvious. But this is an example of how you can make policy work. First of all, random, randomly assigned, fixed payment from a central pool, so they weren't going to be paid by the companies anymore. Um, the, the auditors would be monitored, meaning that once they made a measurement, somebody else would come in, a different auditor, come in and make a measurement. And if that first auditor was correct, they'd get a bonus. And if they were wrong, they wouldn't. So, you know, simple ec economics, right? Ep basically incentivize the thing. And sure enough, this is what I showed you before. This was this control. 
And the new measurement looked like this. So, you know, when you look at the sky, of course, it looks like this. Um, and this was just the first step. This was truth telling. This was basically saying, I need good data. So this is good data. <laughs> so the next step was to publish the data. They published the data. They had the government work with the, the companies. And, and, you know, and sure enough, they, they made a dramatic change. This is now uh, audits after. These are audits later. So there's still companies that are polluting off, off. But there's a much better percentage of companies that really are producing lower amounts of carbon. Uh, in the end, uh, actually, they were able to impact the, the total. Th these are standard deviations from where they should have been, but the total effect was about 28%. So it's dramatic. And very little was done. They're not spending a lot more money. All they're doing is they have a different system of, of incentivizing. And, and, and now you have good data and you have good results. So I'm showing this. It's not a sophisticated data collection scheme. It's not urban science in a deep way. But it is the kind of science that works. <laughs> I guess that's the main point. OK, so I have a few more minutes. So what I'd like to do is, is highlight a few of the things, uh, other things that we're doing at the University of Chicago in the area of urban research. And again, asking that question, what can research universities do uh, in research, but also in practice? And many of these ideas, since, since a lot of our work, and we've been doing urban research like you have for many, many years. But our focus has really intensified recently. And a lot of the things I'll show you are just starting. I'll just give you a sense of the kinds of things we're thinking about. But I also wanted to give you a sense of history. So one of the more famous um, urban scientists, uh, actually in the world, social scientist, his name was Ernest Burgess at, at University of Chicago. In 1921, he had a model for what cities should look like. And the model was really based on Darwinian theory. He basically said that cities were places where you had essentially competition amongst people. Uh, and the competition was primarily for land but also for water, you know, the usual things we think of. And it, purely based on theory, not based on fact at the time, he, uh, maybe slightly based on Chicago, his assumption was that, that people who could afford, people with money, would naturally desegregate or segregate out into these suburbs, which as you know in the U.S. is the way that, <laughs> the way the cities look, but not all cities. He said that in the center would be the poorest people, and, and then as you move further out, uh, you would have the people who could afford to move. And that was all based on a theory, which was Darwin theory. It was basically this competition theory. And now, we know this is entirely wrong. And in fact, even in Chicago, it's not true. In fact, many of the wealthiest live downtown. If you've been in Manhattan, I'm from New York. If you've been in Manhattan recently, I mean, it, it's, you know, the, the, the millionaires are complaining because the billionaires are buying them out. So, you know, it's just not the right model. We know that. And, and Mumbai is, is even more complicated. I mean, it's very mixed. And everywhere you go, it's, it's fractal. I mean, it's, it's very complicated. So, but what's interesting about it was this was a theory, and this was the way urban science was done 100 years ago or 80 years ago, which I still find interesting nonetheless. Very theoretical. What's changing now, of course, is that data is becoming something which, which we have access to. And, and you know, we've had... You know, we, we've had data for many years, but not at the level we can finally start getting it. We've had ethnographic data, interviewing people, and et cetera. But what we're starting to get is real uh, interesting data. And this is just one example of some of the things we have. We just recently launched something called Urban Labs, which is, uh, which is um, a science, which is basically um, data-based uh, policy experiments, essentially trying either proposing new policy, taking policy that exists, and doing essentially randomized controlled trials to see if they're working. Because most, most strategies are not, not tested. I mean, government rolls out strategies that for a while in education, that for a while in social welfare and poverty, et cetera. So what we started to do is put together a set of labs in poverty, health, crime, education, and energy, um, and, and started to, to really think about quantifying. And you know, just like in the experiment I showed you in Gujarat, start thinking about how we take some of the policy that exists and actually do good analysis and get good data. This is an example of, of one set of data in something called the crime lab. And of course, um, in an urban environment, crime and education and, and nutrition, et cetera, are all inextricably linked. So you can't separate the two. And this actually shows that. Here's a, this is a bunch of, I won't go through all these. these. Each of these is a different experiment. And I won't, I won't talk about them in detail. But one, for example, uh, one summer Chicago, is a program now in Chicago which takes uh, kids in the summer and gives them jobs. Sounds, sounds easy. It, it is. I mean, it's not cheap, but it's not very expensive. 
But by doing this, it turns out in, these, in the worst areas, in these red areas, which is where University of Chicago is, we're just north of some of these, um, you actually get to reduce crime by 43% simply by doing something simple. Now, you know, a social worker would have told you, you do that and it'll help. But this is quantifying, really quantifying the results, which is interesting. Uh, another one is called Match, which, which is also very focused. It takes African American kids in, in, in grades 7 through 12, the most vulnerable age in, 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 these, in these fairly blighted neighborhoods, and focuses on one thing. Uh, focuses on math, believe it or not. But it gives them it gives them extra tutoring in math. Typically, these kids are three to four years behind in math. Brings them up to their age or their grade in math. And it has a huge impact. This is sort of a collateral impact, very positive, on violent crime arrests in those same neighborhoods. So these kinds of controlled trials are very important in this kind of thing that we're doing. Another example, which is much more technology, and it gets back to some of the things I was mentioning before, is something we call the array of things. Um, this is work done in collaboration with Argonne National Labs, which you mentioned, uh, so I used to be director of that, and University of Chicago, something we call the Urban Center for Computation and Data. Uh, and the idea here is within, within the summer, this summer, so we, we only have a little data so far, this summer we're deploying a few hundred of these boxes, and these boxes are going to measure a bunch of things. They're going to measure um, th thermal, uh, wind, rain, etc., which are the usual things for weather, but they're also going to range, uh, measure carbon dioxide, nitrog nitrogen oxide, pollutants uh, from automobiles. They'll measure pedestrian traffic and they'll measure automobile traffic. So the question is, what do you do with all that data? And so I can give you some examples. One I've already mentioned, which is if you can measure these pollutants and then also do uh, health studies in the same region, you can ask the question, is there a connection between carbon dioxide and asthma, for example, because asthma, as you know, is growing dramatically in the states, likely growing here too, and it's likely due to a lot of the chemicals in the air. So this kind of thing, you can say, well, we measure some of this today. We do actually, but not at the density we need. So these things will be deployed on most street corners. Um, issues are, of course, privacy because we're collecting GPS data. We're taking photos of every corner regularly throwing the photos out. Social scientists want to know where people are moving. So what, what's the human traffic look like? So we're providing that kind of information. So privacy issues are, are a big deal. But you know, we had a big article in the, in the Chicago Tribune when we first announced this program. Big Brother is watching you, you know, from George Orwell's 1984. People are afraid that we're going to somehow track them. It, well, it's not, like, it's not like your phone company doesn't know exactly where you are 24-7. But, but nonetheless, um, you know, these are the kinds of things that we're thinking about. Here's another example. Sorry? So that's a good question. We're going to do it by neighborhood. So we'll cover uh, big areas of downtown Chicago. So let's call it, you know, 50 square blocks of downtown Chicago. Ultimately, we'd, we'd like to cover a good portion by neighborhood. Um, the other thing they'll measure, by the way, is, is things like energy consumption. So you'll start to think about, you know, regional <coughs> energy consumption, which, of course, utilities have, et cetera. So, so we plan to put these everywhere. But we also wanted to put seven on the, our campus, University of Chicago campus, and our faculty got really upset because they felt we were invading their privacy. So we finally convinced them to do it, but you know how that goes, right? <laughs> so, sorry? Oh, how much do they cost? That's actually a great question. They're too expensive so far. The, the, the chips are actually being built by Intel. So Intel, th these are, these are custom-made chips, so they're about $600 for the chip itself. And the chip chip has like an electronic nose on it, so it does some amount of the chemistry. Um, and then there'll be other kinds of sensors around it. So it's about $1,000 a box, which is too much. We're also getting a deal with the, the city has agreed to hang all these for free. So there's also an in-kind contribution the city's making. And you know, you put somebody up on a pole, these are, um, you know, these are, uh, these are telephone poles, right? Or whatever poles, the utility poles. Um, so it's not cheap, to your point. The goal, of course, is to reduce this by a factor of 10. IBM's working on these, too. So eventually, the price will come down. But you need them to be, if, if they're $100, they're less than a, a stoplight. And so you can imagine them being just part of a stoplight. I mean, they'll be part of that whole system. But you, you, it's exactly the right question. When you want, if you want 100 of them and they're $1,000, that starts to become real money. So the question is what to do with the data. That's the fun part. Here's just another example before I finish, because I will try to finish now. Um, this, um, we, we actually, this is another example of, of a cool program. Uh, this is funded, um, th this is funded, uh, just recently got funded actually uh, by, um, um, 
forgot who funded it actually. Do you remember who, who funded This was, um, it doesn't matter. But this is a project funded called Data Science for the Social Good. I'm not sure I love the title, but, but the idea was that every year now, every summer we have a bunch of students come to Chicago and propose different types of, of, of experiments, mostly digital-based experiments around urban, uh, urban, um, urban neighborhoods. This one is an interesting one, which is why I'm showing it. Um, and um, it's the city of Memphis, actually. And like any city, uh, the city of Memphis has areas that are really blighted and abandoned. Some of them are abandoned, really poor areas in the city. And what they would like to do is ask the question, where does, um, where does investment most pay off? If you think about not just in municipal, municipal financing, but direct investment. If we invested you know, in, 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 this, in this row of houses or this street, how would we, would we optimally have a chance to have co-investment from other you know, uh, private money? And so these students, these graduate the college students, uh, came up with an algorithm to actually calculate, using some amount of economic theory, calculate uh, what areas would make most sense. Uh, th these are basically, so, so green here is very low risk, meaning if the city invested there, it'd be easy. Uh, and in very high risk, red is where if you invest there, there's no chance you're going to regenerate uh, a community. Um, the city, of course, would like to ask where which corridors, so you may not invest in red, you probably don't want to invest in green because it's not very, uh, it won't change very much. So you start investing in light green or yellow, but the point is this was an, a, an economic analysis of neighborhoods. It's an estimate, but an, an idea that you could start thinking about uh, looking at the data in cities. So, you know, data like uh, what kinds of uh, housing do you have, uh, what kinds of storefronts do you have, just putting it all into one place. And this was an interesting idea, basically, of how you take distressed areas and try to improve them. And they're actually trying. So this is based on some, a student experiment. The city of Memphis is going to try some of this in the next few, uh, next few years. So of course, working in urban, on urban situations is really important. And we do it because you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great challenge problem. It's also the right thing to do. But of course, there's always the, the, the incentive which the technology, I mean, you asked how much those, those units cost. IBM is investing a whole lot in this. I mean, a lot of people are getting ready to think about not just smart cities. And, and today we heard, uh, we heard your prime minister announce this $1 trillion program. I guess it's a, ten, is a ten, five or 10 year program to invest a trillion dollars in smart cities, 100 smart cities. So um, although, I don't know, for $10 billion, you probably can't build a city. So I guess they're really looking to co-invest. But, but um, that announcement was impressive. So maybe 25 billion is too small a number. Maybe it's a trillion dollars. But this is Navion, which is one of the, you know, one of the consulting firms. So it's not just that it's um, it's a good idea. Presumably, it, people are going to invest in this. There's money to be made. Uh, there's interesting, um, not just solutions to social problems, but there are huge social gains. And one could imagine not just making money by building detectors and sensors, but also thinking about using this data for marketing, using the data for other types of things. So I think I'll finish there. Um, this is a city in, Gu imagine, uh, this is a city in Gujarat. It's uh, Dolera, uh, imagined as a smart city. <laughs> Found this picture um, recently. There's actually a video to go with this about the smart city Dolera. Do you guys, do you know that city? Sorry? Yeah. So. Yeah. So anyway, it's just an, I thought it was a great way to end. But um, you know, the question of, of smart cities aside, because I think it's important to think about it in smart cities, the, you know, the, the good news is that the cities are very problem-rich environments, very interesting you know, scientific problems. But they won't be solved by science alone. These are problems that, you know, that clearly involve scientists, social scientists, humanists, lawyers, uh, policy makers, and none of these will get solved unless you have the right partnerships. Just not going to happen. And you know, so the example in Gujarat wouldn't have happened if Michael Greenstone didn't spend a lot of time building relationships with, you know, the, the, the pollution control board, with industry, getting help from actually Tata to get the introductions he needed. None of this would have happened. It was really all, that was as important, probably more important than everything else. So when we think as academics about solving these great problems, we should try to solve them. But we have to do it in a very embedded and clear way. So with that, I thank you all for listening. And I take any questions.